This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn. You already know LinkedIn as the world's largest professional network. It's also a better way to find great talent. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit toward your first job post. And NetSuite from Oracle, the last business system you'll ever need. To get your free guide, How to Overcome the Five Obstacles to Successful Growth, go to netsuite.com slash twist. Next up is Peter. Come on up, Peter. Now, last time, Peter, you were working at Tesla. Hi, Jason. How are you? Good to see you. I'm fine. Uh, so you were working at Tesla. You were, you were part of the, uh, the big revolution. Have you driven the Model 3? No, I have not. You haven't gotten in one yet? No, I, absolutely. I have not. I've... Um but you have a Model S or X, I assume. I, I have a Roadster, a Model S, and a Model X. But unfortunately, as I re- relocated from the US to Stockholm, I had to sell the Model S and the Model X, since they, they were, won't work with the uh, supercharging over here. Oh, those superchargers are not, con- uh, not compatible. You no. still kept the Roadster. It's number 13. I have to keep that. I have number 16. I'm right behind you on the Roadster. <laughs> the uh, and I just put the new battery pack in it. Oh, you did? Yeah, so now it goes through. 300 mile range. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that incredible? It is. If you think about where you guys started at Tesla, the number one criticism was range. If you buy an electric car, you're going to get stuck on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. Even the Top Gear TV show faked the Roadster running out of battery. Yep. And now we're sitting here 10 years after the Roadster and the new Model 3, the new battery packs are all going to be, what, 250, 300 mile range? Uh, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you look at the evolution of batteries, you, you clearly see the similar patterns as Moore's law, you know, where every 10 years you, you get a, a pretty significant increase, almost a doubling every 10 years. Right. Moore's law, processing power doubles every 18 months. Yes. Batteries, the density, energy density doubling ten know, years. every ten years. If you look at history, that's what what have happened. The rumor was the original battery pack in a Tesla Roadster was maybe thirty or forty thousand dollars to construct. Mm. What do you think a similar battery pack in the Model Three or a similar three hundred range car costs today? Well, if you're ballparking, if you were to guess. I, I mean, it will be below 15,000. Below 15,000, right? Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. So half the price or less yep. and double or two and a half times the range. Mm. So you're looking at a four or five X yep. value difference yep. in 10 years. In another 10 years, will it do another four X? Will those packs be $5,000 to go the same distance? I, um, it's, it's, it's interesting because if you look at, at uh, uh, the next 10 years, I'm, I'm pretty sure about the cost. Um, that cost will go down in half uh, cost or more. Cost will, will go down um, pretty much, I'm not saying entirely half since I'm sitting with the price list of my own batteries. Sure. Uh, but, but, but they will go down dramatically. And then, you know, as they go sub you know, 100 US dollars per kilowatt hours, then you really go down to kind of low premium cars that don't need subsidies. And, and then, you know, the whole snowball is, is, is just exploding. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, you know, at that point of time that if, you know, that you will choose a combustion engine. And then, you know, in Europe, you're starting also to see the government after government basically putting in uh, legislation against combustion engines. Uh, yes, I've read one country now is saying by, I think it's 2030 or 2040, no more combustion engines are allowed to be sold. Yeah. I'm assuming they grandfather in the old cars. They won't arrest you for driving an old one. No, they, they won't. On the other hand, I mean, so, so Germany is, is talking about 2030. Uh, UK is talking about 2040. Uh, Norway and, and uh, Netherlands has been talking, I'm not sure where it is, about 2025. But, but mentally, when you know that, that your, your car, if you buy a, a diesel or, or a petrol car, is, is going to be 
you know, basically illegal in, in a couple of years, I think people mentally will start uh, uh, facing out those options much earlier. Ah, because they'll see the writing on the wall. They don't want to... Yeah, I mean, selling a second-hand car um, will be very difficult mm. uh, in, in, in uh, you know, both when, when you have the legislation against you and also when you have, you know, the, uh, the cost of, of operating that vehicle. Uh, because, I mean, an, an electric motor is, and, and electricity is so much cheaper than, than gas and, and, and a combustion engine together. I mean, you know, with driving electric cars, it's, it's, it's just so much better economy, even though the oil is, is at record low. Which is, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about North Fault. We're going to talk about your new company. But it is mind-blowing, I think, for those of us who participated in Tesla uh, in the early days, the reason Tesla was going to be successful and the reason electric cars were going to be successful in our minds was we were told $200 and $300 barrel oil was coming. Mm. Not only did two or $300 barrel oil not come, it went back down to $20 from you know, 80, 90, 100. Mm. But at the same time, the electric cars still won and still grew very quickly. Without that... Um, peak oil happening. Why is that? Why didn't peak oil happen? We, ha we know some of the theories, but I'd like to hear you explain it. And why did that not cause a huge problem for um, the electric car companies and Tesla, which you well, participated in? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think a, a couple of things. What, one is, is, you know, obviously, uh, or, or just burning fossil fuels is, is not sustainable. And I think we are seeing more and more evidence that, that we are on a very dangerous path with, with that, even though, you know, Mr. Trump is denying that, but but most of our most of uh, most of us strongly believe that it's it's not sustainable. The second second thing is is that you know an electric car uh, the efficiency is is about 95 percent energy efficiency versus a combustion engine that that you know, it could be about 25 to 30 percent. What does it mean, efficiency, in this context? So, so, so you know, the, the amount of energy that you could convert into, uh, into mileage. Um, so so we, in a combustion engine, most of, of uh, that energy becomes heat. Yep. And, and in an electric car, it becomes mileage. Right. And, and so, so when you have an electric engine that is like three times more efficient, you know, eventually that had to win. Yeah. It, it, it is unavoidable. Uh, and it's primarily just been the cost of energy storage that have been holding it together. But then you also see that, that in, in the field of energy, you know, you're starting to see new solar and wind installations that is generating, um, you know, lower cost per, per produced kilowatt hour than pumping out oil um, out of, 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 for example, out of the sea. So, so then eventually technology is, is, is making uh, that, that fuel dependency obsolete. So the easy oil, which was cheap, um, it was still competitive, but the difficult oil in the ocean, in the sands, in Canada, that oil is so expensive per barrel that it can't compete with electric. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now you decided to start your own gigafactory. Yeah. I visited Elon's gigafactory a couple of, when it opened, I guess, last year. Quite an amazing feat. Uh, why the need to create a new company to do this as opposed to staying uh, at Tesla? Why did you decide to leave and start your own gigafactory? Well, I mean, when, when I left company. Tesla, it, was, uh, um, it, it wasn't my plan to, to, to start this. Uh, I, I actually started investing in, in a bunch of startups. And oh, angel investing. Yeah. My favorite. And, and, and joined, some, um, uh, joined some boards. But then... Um, um, a number of, of friends, uh, we started to look at, at Europe and Europe's transition and, uh, you know, the fact that there is almost 20 million vehicles being produced in Europe um, and, and something has to support that transformation. So we, we looked whether there was a feasibility to, to build uh, an equivalent 
um, uh, type of, of factory uh, that that Elon is is looking at in in Nevada, where you do the the vertical integration to to uh, further take out cost, um, and and what we found was that that perhaps there is an even bigger benefit of of doing it here. Uh, because we have, uh, when you're doing that vertical integration, you're starting to consume even more energy than a traditional battery plant. Hmm. So in the material preparation phase, you actually produce two to three times the amount of energy that a normal battery plant is, is consuming. It's just in different supplier in tiers in the supply chain. But if you're doing that vertical integration and you place it in a place like Sweden, Norway or and Iceland where you have hydro energy, zero carbon footprint and a very, very low uh, energy cost, uh, the economies of scale uh, becomes really, really evident. So um, when we are looking at this factory and, and uh, looking at the energy bill, we will eventually consume almost one and a half percent of Sweden's energy production uh, for, for this plant. To build the batteries. Yes. Uh, so, so when you look at that electricity bill and you compare it uh, with uh, an electricity bill of, of an Asian-built battery, uh, the gap is, is almost paying for all our employees. Wow. Versus uh, a battery factory in Asia, you're saying? because they don't have the hydro there and they don't have that footprint. Yeah. Hey everybody, let me take a moment to thank our friends at LinkedIn for partnering with us here on This Week in Startups. Have you tried to hire somebody lately? It is hard, it's brutally hard, I know. I've got many open positions at inside.com, at launch, trying to grow This Week in Startups and the Angel Podcast. It's hard to hire people. There is a war for talent today in 2017 going into 2018. It's incredibly hard to find great people. And you know the drill, you post to those job boards and you hope that you're gonna find the right person. But let me ask you a question. When was the last time you checked a job board? You didn't, you haven't checked a job board in forever. Most people never check job boards, but there is a place where people go daily to grow professionally and communicate with other senior level executives. And that is of course LinkedIn and 70% of the US workforce is there. You know it as the world's largest professional network, we all do, but it's a great way to find talent. Just ask any of the hundreds of thousands of businesses who have posted to LinkedIn jobs over the past year. Yes, LinkedIn jobs. 22 million professionals view and apply to jobs on LinkedIn every week. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. But I'm telling you right now, 22 million professionals view and apply to jobs on LinkedIn every week. That's week, not year, every week. LinkedIn considers skills, experiences, location, and more to match and promote your job to potential candidates. Think about that. They know your skills. They know your experience. They know your location. So they're matching you with the perfect jobs. That's why 22 million professionals a week are using the uh, jobs boards at LinkedIn. So LinkedIn jobs is 40% higher than job boards at delivering quality candidates. Let me let you have that sink in for a minute. 40% higher than job boards at delivering quality candidates. A biz is only as strong as its people and every single hire matters. You know that if you listen to this podcast, so don't settle for posting and hoping the right person will find you and your role and apply. No, you wanna go to linkedin.com slash twist, linkedin.com slash T-W-I-S-T and you'll get a $50 credit towards your first job post. $50, 50 smackaroos. That's right, linkedin.com slash twist. linkedin.com slash twist for your $50 credit today. Go ahead and go get that $50 credit. Terms and conditions do apply. Thank you again to our friends at LinkedIn. Let's get back to this amazing episode. So eventually, these batteries, uh, the cost will be, if it's gonna be a robotic factory, I'm assuming it's gonna be highly automated. Electricity in our lifetime will be free or close to free, do you believe? What is the cost of, because right now, many people don't even know what they spend on electricity. It's that cheap. It, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a super interesting question because I think um, intermediate, we're gonna have a challenge. Uh, with with uh, with energy, as we we're transfer uh, trans, um, transforming our way out of coal, uh, coal, uh, natural gas, and and oil, which all gives a very very sustainable uh, energy production or uh, stable. 
and and we're moving into to solar and wind that that is very much fluctuating well, in order for for our society to 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 do that transformation um, we're going to need to install um, a lot of energy storage um, and 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 it's going to be a little bit of a, of a challenging time uh, we're also facing out like in Sweden we're facing out the nuclear uh, and is that smart to phase out nuclear isn't nuclear safe and efficient and manageable would you get rid of nuclear this early or or is it wise um, what are your thoughts on that uh, it's 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 a super good good question and it's a very political question. That's why I want to answer. I, you know, it, yeah. I, I think it, I think it's nuclear in this part of the world. The world is safe. Um, I think there is there is probably an end of life of reactors. Uh, the question is is it 30, 40, 50, or 60 years uh, where where those reactors needs to be shut down and, and and be replaced? And I think. I think it's probably possible to, to run them a little bit longer than, than, uh, than what we do now. Um, and uh, it's going to be a challenge for, because, for example, Sweden, uh, we have said that we want to be uh, uh, carbon neutral in 25 years. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to get rid of all oil in, uh, in transportation, um, and, and which means a lot of electric vehicles maybe a little bit hydrogen, but most electrical uh, vehicles. And, and those needs electricity, so we, we're probably going to need, um, give or take, 20-25% more electricity generation than what we have today uh, in, in order to support that fleet of, of electric uh, uh, vehicles. And in, in that perspective, to phase out uh, the nuclear... It makes uh, no sense. It's, it's stupid. Maybe not super good. It's stupid, isn't it? It's an emotional decision people are making because of Fukushima, because of Chernobyl. But those, if you look at those situations, those reactors were very old technology. Yeah. And everybody knew Fukushima was placed in the wrong location. They knew way ahead of time that that disaster was going to happen. Mm. It was only a matter of time. If constructed properly, and if placed in the right location, nuclear is safe. You believe that? I, 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 I do believe that. Um, so this is an emotional reaction to an accident. That is why people want to remove nuclear, correct? Well, I, I, I would say in Sweden, I mean, the, the politicians have done a little bit of a middle way. I, I, I think what, what Germany is doing that is, is very aggressively shutting down all our nuclear is... is um, Unwise? It's a little bit unwise because they also have such a dependency on coal that also needs to be replaced. And you know, you might want to address coal first before you address nuclear. And it's emotional. In Europe, you have an emotional reaction to nuclear. Yeah. That is, ba I mean, I understand organic food and having an emotional reaction to that, pesticides, GMOs, but this seems to be a really bad emotional decision to get rid of nuclear. You would much rather see it I mean, be I, after coal, like you're saying. I, I, exactly, and, and, and I do think, uh, you know, um, we, we are, uh, we are going to go into a period where power, um, so power in terms of, of, you know, massive solid amount of energy is, is going to be a challenge. Um, so, so, for example, our, our factory is going to need almost 300 megawatts of, of, of constant, uh, constant power. And, and to put that in Germany uh, would be a challenge. It works uh, here uh, because we have so much hydro. Uh, but if we would be relying on solar and wind, it would be super challenging. Yeah, and the impact of battery efficiency... Is going and the decrease in solar cost and wind cost in terms of installation of wind turbines and solar, according to my understanding of it, that combined with batteries is going to accelerate uh, our independence on fossil fuels at a pace that people didn't expect. People didn't expect it, did they? To go this no, fast? 
No, I, I think uh, I think the especially the latest year, I think it's been taken by surprise on how fast um, the costs have gone down. But it, but but it's also, I mean, it's a super opportunity. I mean, if you look at India, for example, I mean, India have now put the game plan together where they plan to put in, I think it's like 350 gigawatts of of, of solar. Uh, and, and, and basically to take just a giant leap in industrialization, electrifying the entire country uh, in, in, with a speed that is, is unseen. Uh, so, so the new technology also gives a, a tremendous amount of opportunities. I was talking to Elon a couple of weeks ago about the batteries in Australia. Yeah. He's putting huge batteries uh, into Australia to help them with their, what do you call the cycle of... Um, Peak shaving. Heat shaving? Peak shaving. Peak shaving. Yeah. Define what peak shaving is for us. Well, it's, 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 it's managing. Um, so, so, for example, if you have a household, yeah. uh, your, your household consumption most, most, in most households is uh, you're, you're between 6 and 8 in the morning and, and between 5 and 7. That's when you cook, you, you uh, wash, you do the showers. So that's where your consumption goes up in, in two peaks. So if you have a battery that uh, you know, accumulates energy during the day, and then at those peak hours, you shave off those peak using the battery, then, uh, then your, your average energy generation for those types of household could go down with um, up to 70% just because you don't need to have a capacity that is aggregating all the peaks. Mm. And this is why the power wall and putting battery packs in homes is such a good idea. Yeah. Should every home have one? Is that, if every home had one in Europe, a battery pack of something, some amount, what would that do to the grid and to, the, to, the, to energy consumption? Well, and is it possible yeah. to put one on every home? Is that I, the eventuality? I, 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 I think, um, um, you know, the, the costs, and you're starting to see them here now coming at IKEA. <laughs> so, so, you know, for sure we're going to have them in every home. Um, but but uh, what, is, what is really interesting is, is, for example, if you take Stockholm, uh, Stockholm as, its, uh, uh, as the energy system is, is maximizing, uh, it's maxed out. Hmm. So you can't really put, for example, very energy-intensive industries in, in Stockholm because the, the network. And now when we need to put in uh, maybe a couple of hundred thousand electric cars, uh, I mean, from my perspective, we, we either then have to dig up all the, the cables and, and replace them with new cables, or we need to find a way of bringing in energy uh, in different ways both by putting solar and storage, and then also have storage where we bring in energy during the night when we have low uh, uh, consumption. And thereby, we could still fulfill the needs of Stockholm without digging up Gamla Stan, for example, for its, for, for its grid purposes. Is there some other, are you gonna raise four billion euros to do this, to take about five billion well, if, dollars you know, to build uh, your factory? Um, it, we're talking about four, four billion uh, euros, but that's over a pretty long period of time. Uh, the first phase, we need um, give or take one and a half billion. Got it. Where are you going to get that money from? We are um, hopefully going to get the, uh, some of it from uh, European uh, uh, institutions like the European Investment Bank. Mm. Uh, we are going to uh, get some, some in, in equity investments from uh, institutional and industrial uh, players. And we're going to issue um, uh, some, some uh, depth instruments like green bonds, uh, and, and if the market stays as it is right now, I'm, I'm pretty positive. So if we don't go to a nuclear war with North Korea, <laughs> you'll get this done. If there exactly. is a nuclear war with Korea... It, it will be tougher. It might be tougher. Well, I mean, the, the, the transformation will happen anyway. So, so yeah. there's, you know, that's, uh, that's going to happen. But, but it might take longer time to, uh, to raise the, the funds we need. I'm going to just end on this question. Is there another technology in energy that's coming that could catalyze this even further? Or have we 
pretty much figured out what we need to do. We have a master plan. We just need to execute on solar, hydro, batteries, and we'll be fine as a society and as humans. Or do we need as humans to make another breakthrough? Should we be pessimistic because of all the needs or should we be optimistic because of what's happened with batteries, solar, and wind? I, I think there is, there's going to be continuous uh, breakthroughs. I mean, there is, you know, there is very interesting research on, on, on new types of solid state batteries, etc. But if you look in, 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 in history, you will see that, that take something from, from a university lab into industrialization, into product validation, etc. takes a very, very long time in this industry. Also because the products have such a long lifeline time. I mean, they, they live 10, 15 years in, in a vehicle, so it's a lot of validation. So it takes much longer. Uh, so from my perspective, we have the technology we need in order to drive this transformation now, just as you said. But then it's just going to be get better. And eventually, energy might become free. It feels like if we have free energy, then free water is right behind it yeah. because desalinization mm. is strictly an energy problem, yeah. from what I understand. And food and food creation is largely an energy problem and a water problem. Yeah. So if the dominoes fall, if what you and Elon and what you're doing on your own now, if you guys can accomplish this, water and then eventually food, we could live in a world by the end of our lifetime, our kids could inherit a world with free energy, free water, and eventually free produce. It's possible, yeah? It should be possible. I mean, that's a pretty damn good ending of this discussion. <laughs> All right, everybody. It's going to be okay. <laughs> All right. Trump's got three years and change. And the good people, the great entrepreneurs of the world are working on giving humanity this great gift of free energy, which will eventually result in free water and free food. Let's give them a big round of applause. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank NetSuite plus Oracle for partnering on This Week in Startups. And let me ask you this. How many times have you asked these questions as a business leader? Why does it take accounting so long to close the books? And why can't I get my sales numbers in real time? Did we beat our revenue goal or did we lose money? What the heck is going on? Are we being audited? When you start asking these questions, it means that you've outgrown your business management software and QuickBooks and spreadsheets are fine when you're a bootstrap startup and when you're just getting started. But you can't have mistakes and delays and you can't not be able to get fast answers when your startup grows up and becomes a big, real, sustainable business. So the number one business management solution, of course, for growing companies is NetSuite from Oracle. See what's going on with your business in real time by using NetSuite from Oracle. Revenues, expenses, customers, orders, even your HR department. You can run your business from your dashboard on your phone and know what's going on as the CEO, the president, whatever, anybody on the management team, the board. Their current clients include all the great technology companies you know, including people like Localytics, GitHub, and PlanGrid. Those are startups that got really big and they needed to have this industrial strength business management software. 88% of Bessemer's NextCloud unicorns use NetSuite from Oracle. 29% of recent software industry IPOs use NetSuite from Oracle. And 22 of the Wall Street Journal billion-dollar startups use NetSuite from Oracle. You're getting the trend here. Thousands of companies across America use NetSuite from Oracle. So here's your call to action. Go to netsuite.com slash twist netsuite.com slash TWIST and you will get your free guide called Overcoming Your Five Obstacles to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash twist. Netsuite.com slash twist. Please, please go there and get your free guide to find out how NetSuite can simplify your life. Just go to netsuite.com slash twist. Netsuite, S-U-I-T-E dot com slash twist. All right. Thanks a lot, NetSuite. I really appreciate it. Let's get back to this amazing program. Okay, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm well. Excellent. What did you think of the city of the future? I didn't see much of it, but uh, I'm sure it can't possibly be as good as Stockholm is now. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about iZettle. You yep. founded it when, and what was the origin of the idea? 
We founded it back in 2010, and the idea was really to help uh, democratizing card acceptance at the time. Um, became pretty clear to us back then that small businesses in the area between one to ten employees couldn't get access to uh, financial services in general, which made it more complex for them to, to grow as businesses. Um, and it all started with payments because that was the, sort of the core, core problem that they had at the time. Today it's a bit different, especially in Sweden where we have some sort of other alternative payment methods, local payment initiatives similar to those in Norway, Denmark, UK. Um, but back then, card payments was really the core. And since then, we've you know, started off with, with the ambition of democratizing card payments, and now it's becoming more sort of a question of uh, democratizing commerce, if you like. Uh, what was wrong with the typical card payment system when you started? Well, nothing was really wrong. The, the, the system per se actually works pretty good. Um, it's a global standard, good rules, good networks, uh, so, so the underlying sort of infrastructure is pretty good. The problem was that sort of incumbents, uh, particularly banks, offered the service to, to smaller businesses, but in order for them to, to motivate the acquisition costs of that company, um, they needed to charge a lot of money up front to, to become a customer, really. And it didn't really suit the, the business model of that of a small business owner who, who doesn't really have much, much extra spare money. So needed to disrupt the underlying model. So for a small business, they had to buy the card reader for hundreds of dollars, pay a monthly fee for that card reader, whether they used it or not. And it, it just made it too expensive for a small business to accept credit cards, which then gives them the inability to grow. Absolutely. I mean, looking at sort of the underlying economics, uh, the majority of companies uh, sort of are within the one to 10 employee bracket, and they account for 95, you know, between 20 to 30 percent of the GDP of any given European market, and still they're kind of excluded from all sort of financial services in a way. Why were the banks so stupid to not invest? and give those small companies the chance to grow and then be able to make money off them when they hit 10 employees to 100. What was it that led to this opportunity and in being able, for you to be able to give them the reader for free? You give them the reader for free or close to free? Uh, depending a bit on the markets, but more or less for free in most yeah. markets. Free in most markets. Uh, yeah, well, it depends. I think it's for free. I think it's too cheap. But uh, in Sweden, I think we charge somewhere in the area of 40 euros. 40 euros for the reader. Yeah. Why didn't the big banks see this opportunity? And why did you guys see it? I think it comes down to uh, internal processes. I mean, banks were created way before uh, you know, the, the availability of computers and cell phones. So underlying processes in the bank didn't really support innovation and that type of disruption. So it, it made, made a lot of sense to, to stay above sort of uh, companies beyond 10 employees. And if sort of the company didn't fit the, the profile of that other bank, you could always charge more from, from the smaller companies. So you don't make money off of the reader. No. You make money off of the fees. Well, it's a combination, I would say. We started off making money off the fees, and uh, today, I think, overall, sort of margins on, on uh, transactions is coming down pretty drastically, especially in Europe, where we have a new regulatory framework which kind of pushes down the, the price of transactions. So we moved much more into a situation where we actually cross-sell, if you like, other type of financial services. Could be small business lending, it could be analytics tools, it could be a more vertical POS solution. What does it cost to charge cards here in Europe? In the United States, it's 2 or 3%. Yeah, it's, it's similar over here, again, depending on the markets. But, I mean, in Spain, for example, you're down on somewhere in the area of uh, you know, 0.8%. And uh, in Sweden, it's pretty common with a combination of fees around 
somewhere one and a half to two percent if you're a small business. Now, do you make any money off of that, or does that all go to the Visas and Mastercards and American Expresses of the world? Do you get a little bit of that margin? Absolutely, we do. Yeah. It's uh, still the core core part of our business, but it's changing slowly but surely for for other other services. And the last I heard, you guys were right around a hundred million dollars in revenue. Uh, U.S. Yeah, around, but uh, yeah, so I think reported in 16 was around 70 million euros. 70 million euros. Yeah. And so for you to hit those kind of numbers, if you make 1%, you have how much money flowing through the system at Izettel? I think right now we're at the re- yearly run rate of about 5 billion euros. 5 billion euros going through the system. Yeah. Wow, that's a pretty significant amount. It, your reader has got some pretty decent security in it, and I was reading on the uh, internet, the hackers were trying to take it apart, yeah. and they were talking about how well constructed it is. Um, how, when you start a financial services company like this, how, how much of your effort is in security, and, and what percentage of people, what percentage of transactions is considered acceptable fraud in the industry? Well, I think one of the good things about this industry is that it's very well defined in terms of security and standards. It's also because of that that change and disruption has taken such a long time. Um, When we started back in 2010, what we did, which was pretty disruptive at the time, was to sort of uh, reconstruct the the entire hardware and move 95% of the logic and security that normally resides in the hardware to the cloud. And then uh, re- the remaining 5% we could give away for free, basically. Um, but we spent a lot of time on, on, on security, and no, no question about that. But in, in the card payments industry, and especially in the market with chip and PIN, that's just being implemented in the US, I believe. We just got our chips in the US. Uh, You've had it here for how long? Uh, Quite some time. (laughs) Um, Why is that the case? Why is America so far behind on the chips when you guys had it for so long? I'm not really sure. I I heard some rumors saying that it's uh, actually a French patent from from the beginning. And Ah. apparently, according to some sort of US constitution, it's uh, more or less impossible to to uh, have basic infrastructure relying on foreign patents. That's ah, one of the rumors. Interesting. Fascinating. It, it, they are coming to America now. We use them. Nobody knows how to use them. No? They, and, they, and they barely work. People just take them out of the card reader and swipe them anyway. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so now that you figured out how to make these transactions work and make a little money there, now you're going to loan small businesses money? Yeah. That seems like another opportunity that the large financial services companies have totally screwed up because the people who need loans, in other words, people who are growing their business and don't have access to capital, have the hardest time getting it, and the people who have tons of money Hmm. have no problem getting loans. They're constantly getting pitched on very low interest loans if you have millions of dollars in the bank, and if you have a lower amount of money, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, you probably can't get a loan. No, it's exactly like that. And again, it comes back to underlying processes. I mean, banks typically base their sort of uh, funding decisions on two data points, whereas we can rely on, on live data. What we can do is, I mean, talking about AI and machine learning and all these things, that seems to be the buzzword right now. I mean, what we can do is we, we, we take all the numbers from thousands of small businesses. We understand patterns. So the day that you become a customer with iSettle, we can pretty much predict how your transaction flow will look like over the next year. And based on that, we can give you an advance on, on, uh, on your sort of card payments fees, basically. How long do people have to typically wait to get their payments settled without paying huge fees? What, what did credit card companies used to take? Every couple of weeks they would give you your money, every week? And how quickly do you pay people? Uh, it's actually, again, it comes back to the banks. But yeah. uh, typically, I mean, we give people their, their sort of, we, we settle next day. Next day, yeah. yeah. 
That's where the world is moving, huh? You just, whenever the settlement happens, it'll be same day or same hour soon, won't it? Absolutely, it will be the same day. And interestingly enough, we, we, we always thought that there was a, sort of the demand from the merchants that, that they want the payment same day. It actually turned out that most merchants want their you know, payments settled on a weekly basis. It becomes much easier from, from, a, from an accounting perspective. And from That's fascinating. Yeah. And, and when you give these loans, what will the terms be? Have you started giving them yet? Or? Uh, absolutely. It's, we've, been, we've been working with that for the last one and a half, two years. So it's really, you know, it's fully depending on the merchants. It's completely individual per merchant. Depends on the size of the merchant. Depends on the transaction flow, the risk profile. You know, tons. All right, let's take a, a typical cafe with, you know, that makes $50,000 a month, 600,000 a year. How much can they get a loan for if they need it? Uh, up to 50,000 euros with just a fix. So they basically one month of revenue, they can get advanced to them. Yeah, that's where we are right now. And how quickly do they have to pay it back? Well, there is no, um, th- there is no specific time frame. You know, they can keep on paying it back for 10 years. So they you can just pay the interest or so we have some no amount security. of we, we don't sort of, uh, demand any sort of, of uh, securities or anything up front. Just we base it on, on your data and then, then it's up to you how fast you pay it back. And then obviously we have our sort of expectations and hopes or built into, built into uh, the model, but uh, effectively it's really up to you. And what about the interest? How do you determine what interest rate they should pay? Is it just LIBOR or something? Or? Well, it's actually, in there, it's not an interest-based rate. It's not an interest rate-based product. Hmm. Uh, so we charge a fixed fee, so they know exactly how much they're going to pay back. Got it. And where would that compare? It's just some fee per month on the money, or is it a percentage, or how does it work? No, I mean, if you, if you uh, take a loan of up to, let, let's say, 10,000 euros, let's say we charge you uh, 100 euros for, for, for that uh, advance, then the 10,100 euros is to be paid back at your own pace, basically. And we deduct the, um, basically, you amortize based on your, your uh, transaction fee that you pay to us. So let's say that the normal um, payback rate is around one and a half percent, then we charge you two and a half, where one one percent is actually the the amortization of the the loan. And eventually, will you be looking at yourself as having the ability to help a cafe, not just maybe in this cafe example, get a new espresso machine, but open a second location? Do you think you'll even be able to give them? 100% of their yearly turnover? Is this something where you think you could accelerate the growth of businesses by giving them loans, or is it just short term right now? Right now, it's actually uh, it's still pretty short term. We expect to become sort of slowly but surely better. But if we compare iSettle to, you know, if we compare iSettle companies to sort of the average European company, we can see that the growth rate of our companies is in the area of 15 to 20% year on year compared to the European average of around three to five. And that's really because we give them access to capital. We give them access to other types of financial services that can help them grow the business, which they couldn't otherwise. I mean, for, for me, what's becoming really interesting is how we can use the data of the many we, we onboard in the area of 1,000 small businesses per day around the world and use that data and help these companies also not only get access to funding, to payments, to analytics and all these things, but also help them out with the biggest problem that they have, which is finding new customers. And uh, I mean, online it's pretty easy, but if you run a local cafe at the corner, how the hell do you go about it? I mean, you're probably not the expert of digital marketing. Does it even work? How can you prove that it actually works, spending $10 a day or $20 a day, that that sort of amount invested actually results in more people coming to your cafe? How do you do that? Well, the nice thing is that since we, we control the point of sales, the business system in, in the offline store, we can actually track the customer all the way back to the point of sales and see if we... If, if our customers has managed to do marketing for that customer and bring it all the way to the cafe. So they see a Facebook ad? For example. On, uh, or a Google ad. Mm-hmm. You know it was their phone, and when their phone or their name 
comes into the establishment, do you know it because of their phone ID or from their, just their name when they swipe the card? Well, How do you know it? A secret sauce? Secret sauce. Got it. That's but something uh, in the range of what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And then you, you come back to sort of traditional good old sort of internet marketing where it all started with affiliate marketing, uh, sort of only paying for performance. Mm. Ads that actually generate sort of proper revenue at the end. You can do the same thing offline, which is pretty interesting, I think. So what would be a great example of that affiliate revenue? Well, time will tell. Oh, you haven't <laughs> launched this yet? No, it's not launched, but it's, it's experiments that we run. But I mean, what, what our aim is, is to help these small businesses, to help them out with the most pressing problems. Finding customers, grow their business, take away you know, daily work with things that doesn't really create value for the business. Uh, let's take accounting as such. This is such an example. I mean, today we have tons of uh, cloud-based accounting services integrated with iSettle. So by the end of the day, you just press a button and it all goes into your, your, your cloud accounting software. So in a way, the payment system was a wedge strategy as an entrepreneur. And as you penetrate the market, 1,000 custom, new customers a day, you can open that up yeah. with other financial services. Absolutely. And hopefully without becoming a bank without becoming a bank. And the, the banks, they seem to have started 50 or 100 years ago working with small businesses, but as time went on, they distanced themselves from the customer. It's, it's a really important lesson, isn't it? That if you distance yourself from your core customer, your products just become weak and disconnected. Okay. That was the opportunity for you as an entrepreneur, wasn't it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, getting... Getting back in touch with the with the customer, I think that's that's key. And it's even better because you're studying their data. You know more in some cases about their business than they probably do. I think we do, and uh, I mean the ambition is to to give it all back to them. Uh, let's talk a little bit we, about the different stages of a company. You guys just raised what sixty or seventy million dollars in the last round of financing last year or earlier this uh, year. Around two years ago. Oh, it's two years ago. Yeah. It's been a while. And you're starting to hit that point where you could go public. Um, how do you look at, and this has been a big topic, staying private, using all that late stage capital versus going public and having access to a currency, maybe for employees um, to get some liquidity or to attract them with stock options? How do you personally look at going public versus staying private? Well, first of all, I, I think uh, going public is a way of, of, of raising capital. So for us, I think we, we look at it, uh, at it from, from the perspective of you know, going forward. We know we have a great business model. We also know that we can grow much faster. So eventually it comes down to, to access to capital also for us. Um, and sort of depending on the market and what it looks like, we want to have all the options open, basically. So whether that is IPO or finding money elsewhere, I guess time will tell. But I've been part of one, one IPO uh, prior to, to iSettle. And there's definitely some pros that comes with an IPO, getting sort of the ship in order in many ways, getting all the processes in order, getting reporting, everything needs to be by the book. Makes you more disciplined as a founder, as an organization, as a team. Absolutely. And I think uh, it gives back great benefits to the organization. The, the flip side is obviously how you deal with, with information, how you can motivate your your uh, colleagues. Transparency is a great way of motivating people and, and with an IPO it becomes more complex. Uh, you have this big contemporary in uh, America, Square. Mm -hmm. um, are they very active here in Europe and how do you look at them as a competitor? Uh, they're not very active in Europe. They recently launched a, um, a pilot in the UK so we still don't see too much of them. Um, as a competitor, for sure, they're definitely a competitor. They're extremely competent and, and good in the US. They've done amazing over there. I think to our, our advantage, we have sort of the, the fact that Europe is much more fragmented and uh, a bit more complex in terms of how, you, how to scale a business, especially in, in the financial sector with the regulatory aspects. Uh, but we very much respect them, obviously, and they've got very deep pockets. So we're doing our best to to uh, make sure that we remain number one in Europe and also in South Latin America. 
How many of your customers are involved in what they call the gig economy? Ride sharing, cab drivers, people who are working, you know, five hours today, no hours tomorrow, 10 hours the next day, and just yeah. working as they go. I'd say the majority of, of customers, but not the majority of volume, obviously. But, Got it. Uh, and even more so in, in Mexico and Brazil. Uh, so Mexico is, is the gig economy. Really? There are so many sole traders setting up businesses over there. It's, uh, it's just exploding. But, uh, I mean, you see there's a trend also in Europe and in Sweden. People want to spend more time with better flexibility, stay at home and do their work from home. So, What should the government do about the gig economy? Because in one way, you have a group of um, very intelligent people who are deciding they want to define their lifestyle, they want to work a certain number of hours, and they want to essentially have their company of one person. Yeah. But a lot of the constructs around regulation uh, would categorize them as employees in some ways. Yeah. So it's not very clear in a lot of different countries who is a full-time employee versus who is in ten, what we call 1099 in America or independent contractor status. How do you think this will hash out around the world with the gig economy versus full-time and, and, and how to categorize employees? Because that seems to be a key opportunity and problem with health insurance in some countries that don't provide it nationally and vacation time and other issues? I think that's a brilliant question. Um, you know, our view from, from my side, but also my personal view is that so the backbone of the Swedish economy, for example, is really the small business, everything from sole trader and up. And unfortunately, society tends to, to focus more on, on, on the industrial companies. And I mean, in, in uh, in, in my opinion, uh, there needs to be a, a very big shift in terms of how we sort of support smaller businesses from the political arena, but also from from sort of the, the from from every country around the world, because this is where it's going to happen in the next couple of years. Uh, gig economy is here to stay for sure. Industries will slowly but surely sort of lose some employees due to to machine learning and other things. So. You know, we need to recreate the entire backbone of, of most economies. Do you think it will be better, and we'll end on this, for individuals um, to have the gig economy? Or do you think we're going to lose something important, which is security and the safety net of having full-time employment? Or do you think gig economy is, is actually net-net going to be better for society? I think if we, if we can create the supporting infrastructure around it, I think it could definitely be, be a benefit to society, for sure. All right. On that note, uh, good luck with the IPO or staying private, either one. Yeah, who knows? And uh, it seems like you've built a nice moat from uh, Square by having to have... Uh, all this hard work to get into all these countries. So I think you'll be a formidable competitor to them. Thank you very much. Continued success. Okay, let's hear it for Ice Edel. Thank you. Thank you.